Hi everyone, I'm speaking on behalf of the Groundwork Collaborative, where we believe that we are the economy, every worker and consumer, black, white, and brown. That means the economy only does well when all, including the most marginalized, are thriving. Under that definition, it's clear that our economy was in crisis pre-COVID and is in even more trouble now. Wrong-headed and racist policy choices have landed us here in the midst of a pandemic and deep recession that has wreaked havoc on families and communities across the country and has been most acutely devastating for communities of color. The only way out of this crisis is smart, massive public investment in the people who make up our economy. Bold public investment targeted to the people and institutions who need it most will drive growth, keep families in their homes, ensure workers can get good jobs, and keep people healthy and safe without wasteful tax giveaways to corporations and the rich. But to do any of that, we'll need to win the final boss battle against so-called Austerians who'll say we can't afford to save our economy. The good news is they're wrong. They're wrong on the economics. Economists agree that the real danger lies in spending too little to save the people who make up our economy. Austerity arguments are also based in anti-Blackness and racist myths about deservedness that have been used to justify decades of cuts to vital public services that have disproportionately harmed Black, Brown, and marginalized people and weakened our economy overall. Finally, we know the Austerians are wrong because we know the devastation that awaits if they win. Spending cuts in the aftermath of the Great Recession destroyed jobs, restrained wage growth, and led to a slower and more painful recovery, and far too many never fully recovered. We know what works. Massive, targeted public investment in everyday workers and consumers. So let's make sure we fight for what we know we need to get our economy on track. Thank you. I've been a home care worker for 17 years in Tampa, Florida, and I'm a proud activist with SEIU and the Fight for 15 and a Union. I'm here today to tell you what it's like to be an essential worker and why our nation needs to respect us, protect us, and pay us. I first got into home care after going through a battle with cancer and felt I had a calling to care for people. It's because of the work of black and brown women like me who provide care for our nation's children, aging parents, and people with disabilities that working Americans can go to their own jobs. But even though I'm considered essential, I make only $10 an hour and I have no basic benefits. It is literally backbreaking work. I'm 61 years old and my spine shifted to the right side of my body because I was lifting patients and putting wheelchairs in the back of my car. I have to work 12 hour shifts a day just to survive. The harsh reality of not having sick time or healthcare was especially scary after being infected by COVID-19 twice. I thought I was going to die. Yes, I did. I was in bed for two weeks and I lost 15 pounds and I had no paycheck coming in. We really need to start to investing in our nation's care infrastructure and jobs that promote community well-being like long-term care jobs. These jobs have been at the center of keeping those that are highest risk safe during the pandemic. It's time that this nation starts valuing the hidden work of women of color. That's why I'm thrilled that Florida voters put us on the path to 15 minimum wage, but I will continue to fight. All workers in every state need union rights and a national $15 minimum wage. Every essential worker, every essential worker should be able to take care of our families, no matter where we work, the color of our skin, or where we are from. Thank you. My name is Grecia Martinez Rosas. I am undocumented, unafraid, queer, and unashamed, and I am here to stay. 
I feel powerful today because despite four years of the most racist, cruel, anti-immigrant policies, our people showed up and we pushed back. Young people, Latinos, Black folks, we looked directly into the eyes of white supremacy and we said no. At United We Dream Action, we organized nearly 2 million undecided Latino and young people to cast their first ballot. And let's be clear, this victory is a mandate from the majority of Americans. It's a mandate delivered by black and brown people, delivered by a social movements, the Sunrise Movement, the Movement for Black Lives, United We Dream, and many more. These four years have revealed exactly what we need to defeat, white supremacy. And now our communities have a clear message for all of us we need to deliver for immigrants executive actions and legislations to protect immigrants right away. We won't wait. We are done with bad compromises that seek to trade our dreams and citizenship for more detention camps and ICE and CBP. We are done with bills that exclude immigrants and working class people who have always been essential to our country. Protecting DACA is the floor, not the ceiling of what Biden must do. The people who will deliver this win have rejected Donald Trump's attacks and we want Biden and we want all of us to govern boldly, boldly, just like we won. Our existence is undeniable. Our power is undeniable. Our demands are undeniable and we will win protections for all of us. Thank you. We have got to change American foreign policy. The outbreak of COVID-19 makes it plain. We need to change what we mean by national security. We need to end the endless wars, the misallocation of national resources to the Pentagon, and invest in renewal at home and international cooperation overseas to address the real challenges that face Americans and all of humanity. To stop the coronavirus, to stop climate catastrophe, America has to learn to work with people all over the world, which means we have to end racism at home and in our foreign policy. We have to stop spending so much on endless wars and instead use our resources for the care and repair of our people, our nation, our planet. U.S. foreign policy too often relies on the use of violent force to protect what American corporations decide is in the so-called national interests or for national security. The real threats we face are those related to systemic racism, public health, climate change, and poverty. Yet the U.S. government spends more on the military than the next 10 countries combined, and that includes Russia and China. This endless military buildup does not create good manufacturing jobs with good wages, but spending on infrastructure, clean energy, healthcare, and education would by almost twice as much. Simply put, our foreign policy is taking resources and political will away from addressing the truly urgent crises. We have a once in a generation opportunity to change the overall direction of US foreign policy and to reimagine national security. If we start by dismantling racism and militarism, we're going to be all right. Hi, I'm Melissa Figueroa, National Coordinator for the Student Debt Campaign. As a second generation immigrant, I'm the youngest child in my family and the first to finish college in the United States. I worked hard and I was lucky to receive scholarships and fellowships. And yet the skyrocketing costs of living and college tuition, combined with a precarious labor market and stagnating wages, still required me to take out tens of thousands of dollars in student loans to survive each day while continuing and completing my education. As a working adult in this country, I've had to decide between daily food, medicine, shelter, and paying off this debt. And daily survival will win out every single time. I am just one of 46 million Americans and their families who are struggling with the increasing burden of student debt over the last two decades. You can read the studies. FreedomToProsper.org documents the cumulative impact this burden makes on our economy. We were sold these loans on a false promise that people like myself could take on this risk and borrow on opportunities for a future that would pay for itself as we become the professionals of tomorrow. But the debt we took on is now a debt trap with disproportionate impacts on black, brown, and working class families. 
For the last seven months, student debt payments averaging $400 a month have been suspended due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This offered immediate relief at little to no cost to the federal government and has kept millions of families afloat in this time of economic uncertainty. We now know how easy it is to do it and how much of a beneficial impact it has made. Extending this relief beyond the pandemic, that $400 a month can go to things our generations are economically denied and ultimately time and space to fulfill our potential and contribute not just what little we can, but the best we can to society. Now we have the opportunity to be on the right side of history by making this relief permanent and free us from the debt trap once and for all. Hello comrades. My name is Adi Barkin. Four years ago, I was diagnosed with a mysterious illness called ALS. I went from being a healthy man to being completely paralyzed which is why I am speaking to you with eye gaze technology and a synthetic computer voice. Like all of you, I believe that healthcare is a human right. And I know firsthand that our healthcare system in this country is fundamentally broken. That's why I work every day to promote Medicare for all. Our movement to make Medicare for all a reality is growing because of all our organizing inside and outside of Congress. Last year, we had our first ever hearings and were able to get many new co-sponsors as a result. Now. We are in the midst of a global pandemic where millions of Americans have lost their jobs and their health care, showing us once again why we must not tie health care to employment. We have elected Joe Biden to be our next president. While he is not a proponent of a single payer system, through the work of the Unity Task Force and our organizing, we were able to negotiate incredible wins that are foundational to Medicare for all, untethering health care from employment creating hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs in long term care, aggressive pharmaceutical drug pricing policies that are even stronger than what the House passed, and ensuring that any public option for health care is truly public. But even with a president who has committed to taking these steps, the same people who attack the idea of Medicare for all are now attacking the idea of a public option. They are even raising billions of dollars for companies that are working right now to privatize the public option. We must join together and work hard to protect the floor of what we negotiated and push for more. And now that a rigged Supreme Court will decide the future of the ACA, the stakes of our organizing have never been higher. The movement to win Medicare for all is growing and we won't stop organizing until we have a health care system that works for everyone.